Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. And thank you so much for joining us. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the idea of you wanting to be with us and help us to gain a deeper value of our personal relationship with you so that we can have a closer relationship with each other. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Our topic for today is, well, we're continuing from last week. And our topic is, we are the temple of the living God. We are, believers, are the temple of the living God. And uh, I'm only going to read uh, one verse this week, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. I'm reading the English Standard Version, and it reads, What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. We are the temple of the living God. Now, continuing from last week, uh, we read uh, in the Bible time and time again instances where God has gone to great extents to be with his creation. I provided a place suitable for Adam, that's what he said, and Eve, where uh, God would visit them often. He provided the tabernacle, and then the temple, and then the promised land, and then Jesus came and left and is going to prepare a place for us that where he is, there we can be also. Uh, one of the names ascribed to Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now note that the word ye in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, uh, is where Paul is here referring to the local church as a whole and not uh, to the individual believers only. Uh, now, the local church is the dwelling place of God because believers are the people of God. Exodus chapter 6, verse 7 says, uh, And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out of from under bondage in Egypt. And then Exodus chapter 25 verse 8 says, And let them make me a sanctuary, a place for me, that I may dwell among them. And then Leviticus chapter 26 verse 12 says, and I will walk among you and will be your God and ye shall be my people. And then we go to Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 26 and 27 that reads, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. Uh, and I will place them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them, yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Time and time again, God uh, tells us that he wants to be with us. He wants us with him. And then again, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 uh, 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 the emphasis is on the fact that we are the temple of the living God. Now, the tabernacle was a temporary place just as the human body is a temporary place for the soul. So much of the things we experience in life is designed to be temporary. Many of the people that come into our lives is just for a season. Loved ones that pass away are just for a season, just a part of our lives 
for a season and there is a they're there to serve a temporary purpose they also serve the purpose of teaching us our need for permanency in our lives the need that that God has built in for us to desire something more than temporary but something that is permanent one day we will be with God forever for a local church to compromise its testimony is like a holy temple being defiled. The command of scripture in verse 17, uh, the major part of this quotation is from Isaiah chapter 52 verse 11, but there's also echoes uh, in it of Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 34 and 41. The reference in Isaiah is that the captive nation leaving Babylon and returning to their own land, but the spiritual application is to the separation of the people of God today. God commands his people to come out, which implies a definite act uh, on their part or our part. Be ye separate, suggest devotion to God for a special purpose. Separation is not just a negative act of departure, it's also a positive act of dedication to God. We must separate from the sin and unto God. Touch not the unclean things is the warning against defilement. The Old Testament Jews were defiled if they touched a dead body or the issue from a festering sore. Of course now, Christians today do not contract uh, spiritual defilement by touch, but the principle is still the same. We must not associate with that which is or will compromise our testimony or lead us into disobedience. God command of separation is found throughout the scripture. He warned Israel not to mingle with the pagan nations in the land of Canaan, but yet they repeatedly disobeyed God's word and were punished because of it. The prophets uh, repeatedly pleaded with the people to forsake their heathen idols and devote themselves holy to the Lord. That's a cry today for most uh, preachers that are trying to do God's will for us to separate ourselves from the idols of the people around us, from the lifestyles of the people around us. Uh, God had to send Israel into Assyrian captivity and Judah into Babylonian captivity and Jesus rejected the false separation of the Pharisee. A lot of folks want to act like they're separate, but then that's uh, more of what, depending on who they're around. Jesus did warn his disciples against the leaven uh, bread, which was the false doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And he prayed that they would be kept from the defilement of the word in Matthew world rather in Matthew chapter 6 verse six, in Matthew chapter 16 verse 6 and verse 11 the apostles in their letters to the churches also emphasize doctrinal and personal purity the believer was in the world but he must or she must be careful not to become like the world or a part of the world. And that's part of the problem today. We are in the world and, and we should be in the world influencing the world in a positive way. But really what's happening a lot of time is the world is influencing the church or believers. It's kind of like a, a ship being in water is fine until the water starts getting in the ship. The church must also separate itself from uh, those who reject the doctrine given by Christ and the apostles. 
Even in the book of Revelation, there is an emphasis on God's people being separated from that which is false and contrary to holy living. Revelation chapter 2, verse 14 and through 16, uh, and chapter 18 and 4, verse 4, gives us information on that. In our desire for doctrinal and personal purity, we must not become so self-centered that we ignore the needy uh, world all around us. Jesus was holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners, according to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. And yet he was a friend of publicans and sinners, according to Luke chapter 7, verse 34. Like a skillful physician, we must practice contact without contamination. Otherwise, we will isolate ourselves from the people who need our ministry uh, the most. The lecture on uh, Who is My Brother uh, Sunday, this past Sunday, for the third Sunday uh, Nurture for Baptist Churches, uh, Sunday School Nurture for Baptist Church Congress, the topic was Who is My Neighbor? And that's a, that, that's a question that we must learn the answer to. Uh, it was clear that we are not to be so separate uh, that we neglect showing mercy to those that need mercy. And remember, uh, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. If you withhold mercy, then you might be withholding it from yourself. Uh, or helping those in need. So being merciful and helping those in need centered around loving folks, is how to uh, recognize our neighbor and treat our neighbor the way that we should. Treating others the way we want to be treated. Treating others the way Jesus treated us. Loving others the way Jesus loved us, or loves us. When we show mercy and help those that need us, we demonstrate that the love of God is in us and working through us. On Calvary, God was in Jesus showing his love and desire to be with us. He died on an old rugged cross on a hill called Calvary. He died and was buried in a borrowed tomb to demonstrate the way uh, of the dead that dwell all among us. Uh, there are people dying and there are some, some spiritually dead folks all around us and we should be willing to give ourselves uh, to help them. And then after he died and they buried him early the third day morning, early in the morning, uh, he rose from the grave. He died for us so that we could live with God forever. He died to wash our sins away so that our impurities would not, in our sins, would not separate us from God. That's the major thing of Jesus dying, and uh, to, it was to, to, to cleanse us. What shall wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So, so let's remember uh, to allow God to work through us for the purpose of saving a sin-sick world the same way that he worked through Jesus. And, and what uh, the important part for us is to tell somebody the good news that Jesus died in our place and he rose from the dead. Let's uh, end with prayer. Uh, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. Thank you for being our continuous Jehovah Jireh from generation to generation. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Uh, by now, the Lord has brought us a mighty long ways, as I said last Sunday, and we have come this far by faith, leaning on his everlasting arm. 
So let's continue to put our trust in the Lord to lead us. Let's pray. Pray, Mount Sinai, that the Lord will lead the leaders that the, the, uh, uh, the uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis team uh, that have been making decisions uh, concerning Mount Sinai's well-being. Pray for us that we will continue to make the right decisions and that we won't run out and try to get ahead of God, but that we will always be patiently waiting for his leadership, for him to guide us and to keep us. Uh, with that, I got to say so long until next week. Love you. Take care. Stay safe. Bye-bye.